cast for magic. We come to the Pope on Film podcast to laugh, to cry, to care, because we need that. All of us. That indescribable feeling we get, which I'm describing literally right now. So how describable are we talking about here? That indescribable feeling we get when the Liz a Day theme song begins to play and we go somewhere we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn. <laughs> Dazzling images on a small Twitch stream, stream, sound that is sound, somehow, Amaland horse erotica feels good in a podcast like this. Bunny Williams feels like the stoned parts of us, and May Lynn feels perfect and powerful because here they are. The Pope on Film podcast. We make movies better. Welcome to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is where's your camera? Um, I. Great question. Can you can you see me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh it Looks like I'm not seeing you for some reason. Which is weird, because, like, I can see my camera on the Zoom. Uh, Lower my background, video settings. Is it something on, on my end? I don't know. I don't think so. It might have been an update to the fucking software. Uh, um, post disabled go. participant screen sharing. No, we got it. I got it. Okay, there you go. Hi, it's me. Yay! Yeah, just before the show, Zoom decided to update. Of course. And because of that, it had changed the settings. Huh. All right, then. Bye. It's me, Mayland. It's hot as heck. So I'm actually just wearing a see-through shirt with some stickers on my boobs. It's hot. Yeah. It's way too hot. Oh, uh, so, I am the Pope in question. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Reverend May Lynn. I'm the founder of the Church of Ed Wood. Yes, yes, the Little Lebowski Urban Achievers. I'm proud we are of all of that. It is episode 481, and I've got a, a number of things I want to talk about in the beginning. Number one, I want to talk a little bit about Project 2025. Oh, okay. Which should be on everybody's minds so, uh, right now. So a very, a very, very cheery, cheery topic. Yes. 
it, it this is very important number one and number two okay yeah i will be talking about it for a a bit of self-interest but just hear me out here project 2025 is a sign that the republicans have been emboldened by donald trump's previous regime and Donald Trump is trying to backtrack and act like he's never heard of it before. Yes. Republicans are freaking out about it. And that's good because it really is horrible. And more people out there are are sounding the warning bells over Project 2025. And a lot of people are discussing how damaging, how massively damaging it will be. But I saw a quote by someone on msnbc talking about project 2025 and about how it will affect all of us on a smaller scale that yes project 2025 the republicans new plan to basically install a dictatorship yes it's bad but it, and it will have major effects, but it'll also have minor ones too. And I saw this quote and I wanted to share it in the podcast. The Heritage Foundation has a plot to turn every government employee of any consequence into a personal appointee of Donald Trump. That means everybody yes. that you call in federal service, every single solitary person that you call is going to be one of Donald Trump's either appointees or working for one of his appointees. And that's really dangerous. Your government isn't going to work anymore. The federal government that you count on to get things done is going to be a bunch of hacks who were appointed just like back in the 1920s. And man, the 1920s were a difficult time because the president was a businessman. Yeah. And he was elected. He was like, hey, I'm a newspaper magnet. And my name is, oh, my name is, uh, 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 Warren, Warren G. Warren G. He wrote, Harding. He wrote that rap song. Yes. Uh, Regulate, Warren G. He was a big rapper in the '90s, and he's like, "Hey, now that I'm president, I don't know what to do. So I'll just appoint a bunch of people that I know, and they can do whatever they want." And so it was a real messed up time in politics. But yeah, uh, if Donald Trump does get into office and does put forth project 2025 it sure is going to be like the you know the corrupt presidency of the 1920s man if only there was someone out there who was warning people about that yeah educating them as it were yes about who the president was what were some of his appointees like who was the secretary of state did he do bad things what were those bad things whoever that person is yeah. Is going to be a hero. Really proud of that. Mm-hmm. Secondly, last week we started off the show discussing things that have happened in the last nine and a half years that the Pope on Film podcast has existed. Um, how, hey, let me, let me clarify that. The Pope on Film started off our last episode discussing all of the things that happened in the last nine and a half years that 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 the Pope on film has existed, delighting yes. our tens of fans. Yes. It was a good opening, but um, I've been thinking about it. I want to talk about Charles Manson some more. Okay. So here's the summary of the story that occurred in 2014. So uh, Charles Manson, he was going to get married. He applied for a marriage license in prison because he met someone, pen pal, whatever. This, and this then... is still Jeff, right? We're still yes, doing... no, it's still totally Jeff. It's okay. still totally Jeff. But um, I've got a quick historic approximations to do right after Charles Manson. Okay. But okay, so Charles Manson said he wanted to marry. He met someone and he was in love. <laughs> It turns out that the woman who wanted to marry Charles Manson only wanted to marry Charles Manson so that after Charles Manson dies, she would take possession of his corpse and tour him around the nation like a Elmer McCurdy-esque sideshow. Yes. And um, 
I made a joke about, oh man, so the wedding was canceled, and now Charles Manson won't get the fairy tale happily ever after that we've all wanted him to have. But it's like, I don't see that as being a bad thing. No, no, neither did I. Because I remember hearing the story, and at first it was just, there's this woman, she wants to marry Charles Manson. And it's like, all right, she's got to be another fucking lunatic. Yep. And then and then after I heard what the actual plan was, as you so gracefully described, yeah. then I was like, all right, all right, cool. Exploit the motherfucker. Make some money. What the hell? I, I I appreciate that somebody thought of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, if you're not going to put the man, if you're not going to give the man the death penalty, I think that turning his, desecrating his corpse for decades yeah. is a sort of fitting punishment for the man. Yeah. Huh? And also, really think about it, Bunny. How? Because when I thought about this, it was really shocking. How many people on your friends list would pay money to see Charles Manson's corpse? Oh, fuck yeah. There's a whole quiet cult of Manson. Holy shit. Like, I would say 40% of my friends list would be in line. To, to see Charles Manson's corpse, just period. And if it was on my way, I would stop in. Why yeah. not? Yeah. Okay. But now, but now, with, that the, out with of the, the way, potential, but think of the potential where it just kind of starts where you go see the corpse, maybe a couple of other pieces of memorabilia, mm -hmm. and she makes money at this. It, it it could become a full blown amusement park, Manson Land. Manson Land. You know, you serial can... killersville. Yeah, you can you can go to uh, Clown uh, Town. What the fuck? You you can you can go to the Spawn Ranch section. Spawn Ranch. Spawn Ranch. And they can't exactly serve you acid, but there will be a lot of flashy lights and different colors to try to simulate it to help enhance your cult member experience. Spawn Ranch, and you were riding a horsey. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie. Um, so with that out of the way, We've discussed the Charles Manson. We've discussed Project 2025. Now we can start with our real introduction. And guess what, Bunny? It's a surprise hap! You got yes. the intro? Are we in there? Up? Are we going? Huh? Yes, hit the intro. There we go. Hap. There we go. Are we back? We are back. That was good stuff. So, HAP was originally... Uh, HAP, a.k.a. Historic Approximations, was originally entitled Steve's Historic Approximations, so SHAP is the name I like to call it, repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wanted me to or not. Uh, it was my own unintellectual historical summary of real-life things in history books that people don't 100% know. It, it, was a his, it was an unintelligent historical summary, a historic approximation, because I read the story and then I tell it. It's not 100% accurate, probably like 98, 97% accurate. Also, I like putting words in people's mouths. So, a, and it was a pretty, it was pretty gold. Yeah. The cook who accidentally invented potato chips out of spite Oh God! That yes, that one. was a classic. That was although, a good one. I, although I do love the uh, the invention of the microwave. Yes, from, from the the guys melting chocolate bar, chocolate bar that made him th thought he shat himself. Yeah, thought he shat himself. Uh, the fact that the classic arcade game Donkey Kong owes its creation to Popeye. 
Yes. And our epic Elmer McCurdy uh, shab. Yes. Uh, we spent years doing shaps, but eventually we dropped the S because a dead name is a dead name for a reason. And so it lived on for a time as HAP, historical approximations, until the segment was dropped due to stress and not wanting the podcast to be two to four hours anymore. But one HAP recently fell on my lap, and I knew I just had to discuss it here, and I'm going to try and rip through it, which is going to be difficult because I love this fucking story. But this HAP has it all. It has all the ingredients of a classic HAP. It, a super famous historical figure. Adultery. Murder. Give me all some dramatic right. music, Bunny. True love. What, what, what was that? Give me some dramatic music, Bunny. Dun, 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 dun. It has all the ingredients of a classic HAP. It even has the most important ingredient. Hardly anybody knows that this. This shit actually happened. Okay. So, let's do this. Frank Lloyd Wright. Okay. The brother of legendary playwright Andrew Lloyd Webber and distant cousin of noted singer Taylor Lloyd Swift. Okay. He's also president of one of our uh, biggest... He's also uh, the distant nephew of one of our best presidents, uh, Barack Hussein Lloyd Obama. Yes. He, Not too many he, people know about the Lloyd because the Hussein confuses them. He was all, also all Connecticut State badminton champion. Of course, of course. Oh. Everybody knows that. So he was an architect, probably America's most famous and celebrated architects. Personally, my favorite architect was the experimental 4D architect and part-time DJ, Mr. M.C. Escher. Yes. He was an amazing DJ, Bunny. I don't know if you ever got to see M.C. Escher live. Uh, I, I did, and his shred on the national anthem made me cry. I saw M.C. Escher uh, spin the wheels of steel live before and uh i must have had something because next thing you know there were just stairs everywhere yeah just going all over the place like someone must have slipped me something maybe someone slipped me a mickey but all i know is i'm looking around and suddenly there are fish in the air and then they turn into birds it was a real fucking weird concert yeah so okay small aside i heard this somewhere on a podcast Maybe maybe it's a podcast, maybe it's a stand-up comedian, I don't remember, but this is pertinent to this story. Michael Jordan was so good at basketball yeah, that he had a Hitler mustache for a few years. Really? Okay. Yeah, if you look back, you know, he's doing a Hanes commercial and just a tiny little mustache, like right here on his uh, in the middle of his lip. Uh, and it, you couldn't really see it because, you know, he is a, a, a black skinned man and he, he had a black mustache. But like, do you know how good you have to be at what you do? Yeah. That you wear a Hitler mustache and people are like, OK. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, he is the world's greatest basketball player of all time. So if the world's greatest basketball player of all time wants to wear a little Hitler mustache. I mean, I love his shoes. Yes. And so everyone just sort of looked past that, that he wore a Hitler mustache for a few years. Well, Frank Lloyd okay. Wright. Okay, but but also consider, was this the same few years in which Dennis Rodman was active? Oh, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Dennis Rodman, uh, most well-known for, for two things. Number one, being best friends of Kim Jong-un. And secondly, being a member of the NWO. Yeah. We got really upset when he sided with Hollywood Hogan. Thank goodness Carl Malone and DDP were there. Yeah. To straighten things out. That actually happened. Wrestling's weird. <laughs> so Frank Lloyd Wright was such a good genius, legendary architect. 
that people way back then, people at the time, looked past how much of a sexist, perverted horn dog he was. Yeah. So here's the story. Frank Lloyd Wright, and I didn't fully write this down, so a lot of this is just going to be me winging it. So Frank Lloyd Wright is out there, and it's like the 1910s, and he's like, Hey there, I'm Frank Lloyd Wright. Because you don't know what he sounds like. <laughs> hey there, I'm Frank Lloyd Wright there. Hey, make buildings, they look amazing. Oh, did you see my buildings? I love it. Hey, honey, we're married, and we have kids, and I love you, baby. I'm Frank Lloyd Wright. So, I'm going to build you a house. Hammer, hammer, saw, saw, staple, staple, I don't know. Spackle, spackle. Here you go. Here's your house. Now I'm going to go over here in Wisconsin and build another house. Bang, bang, spackle, spackle. And the wife's like, oh, honey, uh, who are you building this house for? Oh, it, it, it's for nobody. It's for me and my mistress. What, honey? Yeah, I got me a mistress. <laughs> Love her to death. She's got two kids, but hey, I got kids too. It's, it's totally fine, you know? Well, I'm not sure if I'm okay with this. Hey, look, I'm a genius. You know who I am, bitch? I'm Frank Lloyd Wright. I can do whatever I want. I'm Frank Lloyd Wright there. And so he built this house in Wisconsin. The news, the press called it uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's <coughs> love cottage. And he was out in the open about like, here's my wife. Here's my mistress. Here's my mistress' kids. I love my wife. She takes care of the kids. And then here is uh, my mistress that I fucked. And he was just out in the open about that shit. Yeah. And it was really surprising. Uh, so I've got a quote here. Give me a sec. Okay. Local residents were not welcoming of their new neighbors. The superintendent of a county school told a reporter, quote, the scandal is bound to have a demoralizing effect on the school children of the community. It is an outrage to allow young men and women and boys and girls to grow up in the belief that a man and, and a woman can disregard the bonds of marriage. This is like a 1910s, who's going to think of the children? Yes. And I find that fucking fascinating. People were so pissed off. Um... With their sharp tongues, disproving looks, and even threats of tarring and feathering failed to drive the couple from their neighborhood, the townspeople called upon the local sheriff to arrest him. Okay. But he didn't get arrested, Frank Lloyd Wright. And he he, he gave zero fucks. This is this is this he there he two quotes. I've got two quotes from Frank Lloyd Wright that I've combined into one. So these are actual words from Frank Lloyd Wright. You're going to love this. Okay. Two women are necessary for a man of an artistic mind. One to be the mother of his children and the other to be his mental companion, his inspiration, and his soulmate. Laws and rules are made for the average. Okay. The ordinary man cannot live without rules to guide his conduct. It is infinitely more difficult to live without rules. But that is what the really honest, sincere, thinking man is compelled to do. Basically, that's, that's a, a, a quote from Frank Lloyd Wright. So America's greatest architect was basically... I'm a genius, so I'm fucking two women. And that is fascinating. And let me tell you what's even more fascinating. If Chris Pratt came out today and said this shit, then that would be a massive scandal. Frank Lloyd Wright's saying this shit in, like, 1912, dude. Yeah. That is... Huge! The balls on 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 Frank Lloyd Wright. I keep wanting to call him Andrew Lloyd Webber. Frank Lloyd Wright. That is insane to do back then. But 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 he also had money. So yeah, money yeah. helps a lot. 
Yeah, so like 1910, 1911, 1912, it's kind of crazy for someone to to be as bold as that. But yeah, he had money. So Frank Lloyd Webber and his mistress are all hot and heavy. And and uh, eventually the mistress gets a divorce and she takes her two kids and she goes and moves in to the Love Cottage in Wisconsin. Okay. And then Frank Lloyd Wright goes to his wife and says, hey, my girlfriend got a divorce. So give me a divorce. I'm going to go marry and bang my mistress full time. And Mrs. Lloyd Wright's like, uh, okay, two things. Number one, fuck. And number two, off. You're not getting a divorce from me. Uh, screw you. So no divorce for Frank Lloyd Wright. So so let's let's pin this story right there. Okay. okay? Frank Lloyd Wright hired a bunch of people bunch of people in his lifetime there was a handyman named julian carlton he was a bit disgruntled his wife was the cook and one day uh frank lloyd wright's mistress is there with the kids and some friends and they're over at the love cottage and the the Guy is working outside, handyman doing everything. Julian Carlton and his wife is making dinner. And then his wife makes dinner. And then Julian Carlton says, oh, hey, hey, honey, great job. Great job. You know what? Why don't you leave now? I'm going to stay here and uh, discuss business. So he, he I, gets I, out. I hate to interject, but I don't think this new version of Zoom is giving us the 10 minute warning. I know, I noticed that. So I'm calling it a 10 minute warning. Okay, 10 minute warning. That's fine. So so Julian Carlton's wife leaves and he's like, Hey everybody, uh, how you doing? It's me, Julian Carlton. I'm not disgruntled at all. Anywho, uh, Frank Lloyd. Weber, Frank Lloyd Wright wants me to do a bunch of shit around the house, so uh, hey do you know where the axe is? Oh, it's over here? Okay, great thanks, let me go over here step, 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 spackle, spackle step, oh yeah, here's the axe if Frank Lloyd Wright really wants this sharp, is there an axe sharpener anywhere? Oh, right here? Okay, thanks, sharpen, sharpen sharpen, sharpen, now that's nice and sharp, it Frank Lloyd Wright wants me to do a bunch of things around the house. Do we have gasoline? We do over here. Great. Uh, that's pretty good. Do we have any more gasoline? Any more? We do. We do. Okay, great. Yeah, great. Wonderful. All right. So, yeah, you guys just hang out and do your thing. And um, I'm just going to be here with my sharp axe and my <laughs> shit ton of gasoline. <laughs> so his wife is gone. They're eating dinner. Oh, there's a the 10-minute warning. Ah, okay. Uh, so, Frank Lloyd... So, Frank Lloyd Wright's wife and kids and some of their friends, they're there and they're eating dinner and suddenly they're like, oh, what's that weird smell? I don't know. That's bizarre. And then they look at the door the to the uh, dining room and there's water coming from the bottom of it. And liquid, and they're like, huh, maybe, you know, like a washing machine overflow yeah. or something. It's like, huh, this must be a plumbing problem. Let's call in Julian Carlton. Maybe he has a uh, an answer for this. So Julian Carlton shows up, probably upset that Frank Floyd Wright isn't in the building, but he goes to work anyway. He axes the mistress to death. Okay. Axes the two kids to death. And everyone else left in the house, he sets the entire house on fire. Frank Lloyd Wright? Frank Lloyd Wright's mistress, her two kids, and all of the people who were visiting his house okay. were killed except for two people. Two people survived. And seven people die. It was a massacre at Frank Lloyd Wright's Love Cottage. Okay. So then people are like, "Oh, it was Julian Carlton. He must have been. He must have been disgruntled." 
and they're looking for him and they're looking for him and eventually they find him inside the basement's furnace. But don't worry, he didn't get burned alive. It was all the acid he swallowed after he killed everyone. Oh, nice. There's no real motive. He was paranoid and disgruntled. Eventually it was learned that uh, Julian Carlton and I, his I, wife were being let go. I and this think was I, I believe I know the motive. Yes? Considering where this axe murdering took place, Wisconsin. clearly somebody forgot their jukebox money. There you go. Yeah, that's what happens. The Love Cottage is a masterful Fred, piece of architecture. Fred warned Fred you. Don't forget your jukebox money. You were fucking warned. You forgot your money. Now you're dead. Here's, here's an important message to everyone out there that might be listening or watching or uh, following along at home with the home game. If you're ever depressed, then just think of the most serious song you can and then imagine the guy from the B-52s singing it. Yes. There have been times when I have been super massively depressed and the only thing that cheers me up is I heard there was a secret chord that David played, and it pleased the Lord. So, there's just a little life hack for you. Yeah. So, the local paper said that the fire... Oh, this is fucking crazy. The local newspaper said that the fire was, and I quote, the strongest argument that the avenging angel still flies. Nice. And if I may interject, what the fuck? Yeah. Holy shit, dude. That is an insane thing to say. People are dead, bro. In including I mean, kids. Including children. In a horribly violent way. But then uh, Frank Lloyd Wright is going to Frank Lloyd Wright. So in 1914, he rebuilt it. He rebuilt the house. In 1912, this happened. In 1914, he finally finished rebuilding the house. A woman wrote a letter of condolence to Frank Lloyd Wright. They started writing each other. And in 1923, his wife gave, finally gave him a, a divorce, and he married the, his pen pal. Yeah. <laughs> then in 1924, the house that he had just rebuilt burnt the fuck down. Oh. Again. This time because of faulty wiring. Now, the house, which is called Tallison, is now a historic landmark, and you can visit it. Of course people think it's haunted. I think it's haunted. I would not, for the life of me, go there with, like, a mistress. Because I feel that and if you visit Frank Lloyd Wright's Love Cottage in Wisconsin, and you decide not to bring your wife and you bring your mistress, you're cursed. Yeah. Also, side note, uh, Asylum Films, call me. <laughs> I've got a great script idea. Yeah. This movie writes itself. Period. <laughs> the Frank Lloyd Wright curse. I can 100% see this entire film. But anyway, uh, that is our hat. Probably the last hat ever. And I gotta say, uh, I know I've said this at the end of each and every single solitary historic approximations we've ever done, but I'm shocked more people don't know this story. Oh, so am I. Because oh, this I mean, is like this some is... lurid tabloid shit. With a an extremely famous person. Yeah, people know Frank Lloyd Wright. People go, oh, Frank Lloyd Wright, yes, the architect, and uh, uh, Falling Waters, and yeah, he's a, he's a, an amazing, famous person. But what you don't hear is, he was a fucking hound dog whose mistress and kids were axed to death? Yeah. And he, he built a haunted house. This is shit that more people need to know, and I'm surprised <laughs> that more people don't know it. 
But there you go. That has been our historic approximations inside of our introduction, commonly known as Jeff, aka the Bunny, the Betty White Memorial Podcast segment brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Download today. What a packed intro. Yes. An incredible introduction. But let me tell you, Bunny, I already wrote the introduction for next week's episode. Okay. And I'm going to give you just a little hint. Okay? The movie Amityville Perrin. Okay. And Shark Side of the Moon. Those are both real movies. Okay. <laughs> That's a hint for next week. Uh, wink, wink. Okay? okay. So I already wrote next week, so I'm super excited. It, next week's uh, Jeff is going to be even better than this one. But we still have movies to discuss. Bunny, don't get angry at me. Look at it this way. Since the podcast is ending in October... This is probably the last shitty double feature we'll ever have to watch. Probably. This was rough. Uh, this was a this was a pretty difficult one. I hated uh Willie Shatner. Watch out, Eleanor, because you don't have a shirt. This is the internet, okay? Thank you. But before we get to any of that, maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. I concur. We will be right back with more of the Popon film after these commercial messages. You know what I miss, Bunny? You know what I miss? What? You know what I miss? What do you this miss? is a weird thing to miss, but I miss promotional consideration paid for by the following. Yeah. When was the last time you heard that? Uh... When was the last time you heard that? When was the last time you heard Calls toll free. Yeah. Mm. Not available in stores. Like I, I just miss promotional consideration paid for by the following. I want that on a shirt. I want that on a bumper sticker. Uh Eleanor got the coolest sippy cup in the world. She wants me to show it. Here you go. It's uh she has two of them, and they're sippy cups. You can fill them up with any drink you want. They're kind of insane and super heavy. But yes. I concur. We will be right back with more of the Pope on Film after these commercial messages. Do 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 and break. Are you a woman in the Utah area looking for ugly clothing? Then stop on down to the Black Dress Warehouse. We are Utah's leading supplier of black or dark gray dresses. Do you want to look like a housewife? Do you want to look like a woman who is suffering depression or is possibly mourning the loss of a, of a loved one? Or perhaps you're a woman being haunted by the grim specter of death. If you are, then come on down to Black Dress Warehouse. 
We sell black dresses, and that's it. Off of Route 9 and Main Street, Black Dress Warehouse. Montage, montage, disco montage, it's a montage, we're cleaning up the streets, we're getting people with wife beaters, asking them questions, in an alleyway, I'm wearing a peach colored suit, and everything's cool, it's a montage, a disco montage. Is that a jeepney? That's weird. It's a montage. Here's my business card. It's a montage. A disco montage. We are cleaning up the streets. We're whacking the attack. And sometimes we're attacking the whack. And sometimes it's a whack attack. Because we don't have a coherent catchphrase yet for what we are doing. Maybe we should get some better publicity. Maybe hire somebody to do this stuff to figure out what we should call this. Maybe we can do that in our montage. Kung Fu montage. We're talking to drunk people. That might... I think that's MC Hammer now. MC Hammer's drunk. He is drunk in a hallway. We're walking past pawn shops in our montage. A Kung Fu montage Disco Godfather And a guy with an afro A really impressive afro In a montage Walking down to something Not really steps but Maybe that is a thing And this guy's got a briefcase And he's got his at a pipe uh, I don't know what he's doing He's signing a piece of paper in a montage, Smokey the Bear montage. They are walking down the streets with some fine ladies in a montage, beating up random people that they see on the street. Got real big glasses, see somebody beating up people, doing real bad kung fu, getting some guy, grabbing him by the sweater. Slapping him across the face, his sweaty face in a montage. I've got a dog montage. A one, two, three, four. You look so pretty next to somebody else. I'll tell you, I'll just tell you.
Huh, look at this. Certified frustration free packaging. Hmm. Not not frustrating, that's good. Guess I just pull here and uh Damn it. Damn it. Damn it. Kate. These are some of my favorite worst posts from the last few weeks on the Oklahoma City Craigslist page. This one is called Prince Media Pandering. And it says, Prince, you would have thought he was the president the way the media carries on about this non-talented transvestite! Exclamation point. So, transvestite! Every channel went on and on and still are, I say good riddance. Typical left-wing, pandering media, always pushing their cause. Hell, when Elton John dies, they will probably declare a national holiday for him. They should, because Elton John is a treasure, number one. Uh, number two... Mm -hmm. You need to check yourself. And third, it's not media pandering. Apparently, it's a pandering media. It's, it's a media that's run by pandas. It's a pandering media. I like that. You don't have to imagine that we're back. Because we are. Death is the youngest thing alive, for it is born and reborn 13 times, each time from a different dementia. A miasma of madness hides the one who delivers death, one who walks with silent tread and strikes with ruthless force. Is it the mother, demented by grief, or the attentive daughter-in-law, whose voice is soothingly hypnotic? Tell me, I promise you. Is it the sun who with fire creates beauty? Or the doctor who can cure and kill? Or perhaps the new bride, tortured by the ever-present nearness of death? Know the frenzy of a wedding night in which a marriage is consummated in a passion of terror. You too will be mesmerized by a world that cannot be, but is. The mystery of the enigmatic leads to a strange rendezvous, an attempted escape, a meeting with terror. exactly how to turn this quiet town into a hell of violence. The Negroes will literally, and I do mean literally, control the South. They are willing to fight down to the last ditch and keep fighting until this thing is over. 
The intruder. He made the sleepy town of Caxton his town for his reason. He played on their fears and their hatreds. This town became a headline for the intruder. He brought an end to innocence. He exploited a woman's weakness. He turned neighbor against neighbor. How come you walk that bunch of black niggers to our white school? I don't see anything I do as any business of yours. And sooner or later, it would happen. He would make it happen. Over here. It's all right. You're alone with a white girl in the basement of the school. But you didn't try to do anything. Is that what you expect us to believe, nigger? What's the big hat? And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. It's time, buddy! It is time. It is damn time. Yes, you don't know buddy. how much time it is. It is time right now. It's time. It's not it's yesterday. Time. Not tomorrow. It's now. The time right the fuck now. So I specifically, I didn't want to write the intro uh, that I've been doing for about nine years. So I just wrote, use any old intro. So I will be doing an intro from Rocky Four. Okay. It's time, Bunny! It's time! It's time!
Yes, Bunny, my friend, it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film podcast to whip and or nay nay our way into the final half of our big shoe. And it is said, big shoe, wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our main event. And so, for the thousands in attendance and the millions are watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, and gender rebels. Oh, let's get ready to count yo's. That doesn't really apply. That was last summer's. Uh, yes, movie of the week. And this week we've got yet another uh, very cheap double feature of low budget shock with a look at two movies from the '60s from Roger Corman, 1962's *The Intruder*. And the king of crap, Francis Ford Coppola's Dementia 13. I had a hard time watching this double feature. Bunny, if I had known how racist the first film was, I literally picked it because, wait a second, Willie Shat stars as a bad guy in a Roger Corman film called The Intruder? Sign me up, please. I had no idea how much the N-word would be dropped. Yeah. In this film. And it was quite shocking. Yes, but imagine how and this is this is really where it gets big points for me. Yes, you were shocked, but imagine how fucking shocked people were in nineteen sixty two. Uh okay, okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Um fuck this fucking movie. It's a good movie that speaks about an important topic. It's okay, okay, hold there. It's a good movie for a Roger Corman movie. We always have to consider that. But this is a Roger Corman film. He didn't set out to say, I will use my time and effort and resources to make an important film, a film that teaches people about the importance of the civil rights movement and race relations. No, we know Roger Corman's shit by now. We're spending all summer watching his movies. He didn't make this movie as a touching lesson to teach people about race relations. He used this movie as a way to use racism to make more money. Well, this is a okay, grindhouse still, movie that accidentally has who, a message. And I Roger fucking Corman, hate this movie. That's just who Roger Corman is. And yes, all of Roger Corman's great movies are accidents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just playing I... the odds that out of 900 movies, you got like, what, maybe 10 good ones? Yeah. Okay. Did he do Chopping Mall? I really like Chopping Mall. But for this movie, considering the time, yeah. Roger, here, here is what I say, okay? Roger Corman's heart is oh is almost always near the right place. Okay. So okay. so yes, most definitely Roger Corman was sitting back thinking like racism is really bad. And I could speak out of, out about it and turn a tidy ass little profit. <laughs> I feel like, oh, wait, they're making a big motion picture uh, about the book To Kill a Mockingbird? Well, I need to throw together a fucking racist movie. Was that the same About year? a small and town. Yes. And yes, that is very much Roger Corman. Because this movie came out like a few months before To Kill a Mockingbird hit theaters. Because To Kill a Mockingbird... Because this movie came out around summer of 62, and the movie version of To Kill a Mockingbird came out that December. Ah. So I literally think this is just a version of Disney's making a movie about fish? Then we need to rush out a shark's tail. Yeah. And then they rush out a shark's tail, just like uh, how DreamWorks made Ants and it came out before A Bug's Life. 
Yeah. I feel like the intruder came out because they were making To Kill a Mockingbird. And also, I think another reason why I had a hard time watching mm -hmm. this picture is because in a in any other, if we had watched this in the 90s or the 2000s or the 2010s, yeah. then it would be like, oh, wow, look at this time capsule of a different time. Yeah. When people were more that, prejudiced, that was where are we living this entire fucking movie? That that was problematic, but like it's that was hard. you can't really blame the movie for that. You know, like I, I like just like I have a very hard time watching Jojo Rabbit for very much yes. the same fucking reason, but yeah. that does not make Jojo Rabbit a bad movie. Here's the thing is that we're going to have a hard time because I do have one defense of Dementia 13. Okay. Which which I am wildly proud of. I found a way to defend Dementia 13 and now you're defending the intruder. This yeah. is this is quite interesting. Yes it is. Yes it is. I Shatner is Shatner. What I got to say though, uh Willie Shat uh, he does a great job in this movie. I saw someone say somewhere on some review that uh, he was in his early 20s when he made this film. No other person would be insane enough to do such a insanely racist movie as their first movie. Yeah. Because, damn, can you imagine if he would have been typecast? Captain's Log, star date 350.7. We are uh, visiting the home of the Klingons. I hope they're not Jews. <laughs> you know, like that would have been that would have been bad. It, it's shocking that someone this famous has such a racist bad guy part in his past, but he does a great job. Yeah, it he does almost. Too good of a job. Yes. It's like, wow, William Shatner sure does a good job of being a lying racist asshole. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, and slimy womanizer, borderline yeah. rapist. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. William you, Shatner's you can, really good at being a you loud can say the mouth. Word over and over again. But to put yeah. a rape on film, that's over the fucking line. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? Isn't yeah. that something? It's like, oh, oh, <coughs> William Shatner's the bad guy in a movie called The Intruder. I, I'll watch that. I had no idea that it was about this. Okay, buddy, hit us with the plot, if you can. For The Intruders, okay. Uh, William Shatner uh, comes to a small southern town. Uh, basically the race bait. Uh, okay, let me let me let me pause after... it right there. Let me pause it right there, and and I want to say something really important. He's a carpet bagging northerner. Yes, yes. Who goes <laughs> to a small southern town? It's the carpet bagging northerner part that well, I just want to interject he's, there. He's from California, but it's the principle is the same. Yeah. Uh, shortly after integration was passed into law, and black kids were going to go to a white school, like, I don't know, like that Monday or some shit. William Shatner comes into town to stir up a lot of trouble about this, to feed the racism. To get them to stop these kids from going to school. Uh, and then there is like general horribleness throughout yep. th throughout the rest of the movie. Uh, the black kids try to go to school. Uh, a couple of rednecks blew up uh, the the black church. Things of that nature until it takes kind of a, at first it has an 
almost borderline Mississippi burning kind of vibe to it. Not yeah. quite. But it look that kind of feels like a, a story Corman tapped into, and he sure as shit tapped into Emma Till. Yep. So absolutely. So this one black kid who was going to school gets tricked into going into a basement with a white girl who screams and accuses of him rape. Yes. The townsfolks grab him, drag him to the swing set? I was really confused by that. What, there are no trees in your town? Pretty sure I saw some trees, but I mean, it's, oh no, he's going to be gently swinged to death. So, so they're gonna. They don't tie him to the slide soon. They're gonna lynch him to, a, lynch him from a swing set. Again, this is a Roger Corman movie. Yeah, he's so, making do with what he has. Let's just go with that. Uh and they're going to. They're gonna lynch him. They're all riled up. They're having a great time. The party is on. Uh, and then this other character that I forgot to mention before, no big deal. He's Deus Ex Machina. He comes walking up to the swing set and tells him everything that he knows and what a fraud William Shatner is and all that and the, how he put the girl up to do it and he brought the girl with her and the girl admitted. And William Shatner goes all weird and everybody abandons them. The end. End of film. End of film. And here's the thing, I'm watching the film and William Shatner has come is like a bigoted person from a liberal state, which has come to the South specifically just to sure stir shit up yes. in regards to race relations. And that's the only reason why he's there is just to to get the townspeople to rise up against the blacks in town. And so I'm thinking, okay, who's going to be the hero? Which one of these people in this small town is going to be the hero? It's not going to be the old lady who runs whatever the inn. It's not going to be her. She said the N word. She said the N word like 30 times in the first five seconds of the movie. It's not yeah. going to be her. Who's it going to be? It's not going to be the scuzzy door to door salesman with the creepy relationship with the random chick no reporter it's going to be the reporter the reporter journalism is going to prevail and he just lost an eye okay it's not going to be him yeah. who is it going to be ah look at this a beautiful speech by his wife oh i'm going to to do what you couldn't i am going to learn to under to, to to understand this oh it's going to be her she's going to rise up and then you don't see her again no and i'm like who the fuck is the hero then and then right at the end in sweeps the creepy door to door salesman who previously had a gun yeah and he's like i'm the hero now and it's like fucking really <laughs> really okay i guess you got to finish the movie somehow that's exactly how I felt about the ending of the movie yesterday. It's yeah. a great film, great film. And then the ending, you gotta do what you gotta do. Exactly. Is it a good exactly. Ending? I mean no, it's a serviceable one. In particular, you, you've gotta give them an ending that makes the audience feel satisfied walking out of the theater. But now yeah. in reality, because like it's not like it's not like with everything he said, they were, the, the town was like, oh, William Shatner's a racist? No. Mm -hmm. And all walked away. And why would they have fucking cared if, if the girl lied? So, you know, it's like, uh, so I'm picturing the real ending being something more like, well, boys, apparently we were kind of hasty in all this. Apparently, we were wrong. Little Jenny, or whatever the fuck her name was, has clearly yeah. admitted that she has lied about the attempted rape. 
But since we're all here anyway. I mean, we got the rope. He we is all, all tied the way down up here. already. <laughs> I already canceled my book club. Yeah. Let's just go ahead with the lynching. Yeah, absolutely. Guess how much this movie cost, Bunny? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go five grand. 90,000. 90, okay. Yeah, but let me tell you, the next film, way less. Uh, way less. So, this was made to save tickets. Kudos to Willie Shat. He does a good job playing an a-hole. This film had a hard time getting released. Big shocker there. Yeah. It was released under the names The Intruder, Shame, The Stranger, and I Hate Your Guts. Okay. And the movie bombed, and Roger Corman had the following suspicious things to say. Okay, here you go. Um, I think the movie failed for two reasons. One, the audience at the time simply didn't want to see a picture about racial integration. And two, it was more of a lecture. So from that moment on, I thought, my film should be entertainment on the surface. And I should deliver any theme or idea or concept beneath the surface. And so basically, this is Roger Corman saying, oh, the movie bombed. I guess that's what I get for having a lesson in my film. Okay, yeah. new rule. My films are only about entertainment. And if I teach anyone shit, it's accidental. Let's go make some shit. And so, oh, okay, that... That sort of sours things a little bit. Yeah. And I think it's a bit suspicious to say that. But that's the intruder. The, f the fact of the matter is, Willie Shatner is eventually um, exposed as just some out-of-towner who came into town just to rile everyone up to uh, rise up against the blacks and start like a, like a race riot. Yeah. And if this were to happen today, he would immediately become super famous and become a celebrity. Oh. He'd be oh, on God, Newsmax, yeah. he'd be on Fox, he'd have his own a podcast, he'd be selling supplements, he'd be doing Bitcoin, he'd be super famous. Oh, 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 no doubt. He, he, he and that's kind of fucking sad. He would definitely be Charlie Kirk. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Not a okay. doubt. So that's our first film, The Intruder. It's free on YouTube. You can watch it. It's a movie. So let's move on to okay. our second film. Francis Ford Coppola's Dementia 13. Now, this movie sucks ass. Yes. It's notoriously horrible. And I have seen 4K ultra high definition restorations of this film where I still can't hear what the fuck they're saying. Yeah. But seriously, the synopsis on this movie is super, super easy. Yeah, this is a horrible film. But, as a trans woman, I am going to start off defending the movie. One aspect of this movie. One okay. small, tiny aspect of this movie. Okay? Okay. So this is what happened. Roger Corman was making the film The Young Writers, and he had a bunch of money left over from the film. So he went to the sound guy. A young guy named, uh, what's his name? Frankie Coppola. Okay. And he said, hey, Frankie, you always wanted to be a director. Uh, I got some money left off from the last movie I had you work, The Young Writers. If you give me a good synopsis, I'll let you write and direct my next film. Here's what I want. When you're writing the script, this is what I need. Three words. Cheap psycho ripoff. Yes. We've got a castle. 
make it spooky, murders, cheap psycho ripoff, go. Show me what you got. And so he went and he wrote this, and a, he immediately went and like, okay, I need to come up with a story. I need to come up with a treatment. And so the first thing he did was he wrote out the scene in the lake. Yeah. So the first thing he wrote was the scene of she ties dolls together and then she strips down and she dives into the lake and puts the dolls down there knowing that eventually the dolls will rise up and scare the old woman and she'll know that that the haunting is real and she'll give her all of the money and whatever. But while she's down there, she sees like the body of the dead little girl in the grave or whatever. So she swims up to the surface and the moment that she gets up, she is at the feet of a bloody axe murderer who chops her alive. And Roger Corman is basically like fully erect at this point. And he said, here's 20,000. Go make this shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a cheap psycho ripoff, even down to the fact that the movie's about one woman. And she dies halfway through. Yeah. It's even got that little psycho bit. And yes, this movie is bad. The movie's very bad. But you know what Dementia 13 doesn't do? What? Blame everything on a cross dresser. Okay. Because that All right. All right. psycho is a work of pure genius, except for the last fucking five minutes. Yeah. I will throw my TV through a fucking window because of that one speech that the doctor, psychiatrist, whatever detective does yeah. about how this man wanted to be his mother. And so the torment of losing his mother caused him to go insane. So he began dressing as a woman because he was an insane murderous trance. Okay, so yes, psycho gets 999 points and as far as I a trans woman am concerned dementia 13 one point okay one point it doesn't even have to be because you're a trans woman it just has to be because that's a fucking bullshit excuse yeah yeah it is a bullshit excuse but at least dementia 13 doesn't pin it all on trans people so yeah this movie is shit yes so the intruder cost 90 million, 90,000, 90 million, like anyone would ever trust this man without much money. Uh, our first film, The Intruder, was made for $90,000. Dementia 13 was made for 40000 Half of the money came from Roger Corman and then half came from uh, uh, Frank Co Frankie Coppola selling the international distribution rights to the film before he even made it. Okay. So it's pretty shitty. You know how you can tell that a movie's really old? Oh. You can watch the entirety of Dementia 13 on Dementia 13's Wikipedia page. Oh, nice. I know two other movies that you can do that. Killers from Space with the, the aliens with the ping pong ball eyes. Yeah. And Night of the Living Dead. The original. Nice. They're coming to get you, Barbara. So yeah, you can watch the entirety of, of uh, Dementia 13 on Wikipedia. And I gotta say, there are some different... Okay, okay, okay. But just because you can... Doesn't mean doesn't you mean you should. I will say there are different cuts of this because he said, "Here's my movie. It's my first mainstream film, and it's a masterpiece. And I'm a genius. And I'm Francis Ford Coppola. And I'm going to be huge." And Roger Corman, being Roger Corman, looked at the movie and went, "Okay, this is shit. I'm going to change this. I'm going to cut this. I'm going to re-edit this. I'm going to completely remove this part." We're going to lose these five minutes, and I'm going to film a new opening. So I have seen this movie before. I've seen Dementia 13 before, but it was back when I was uh, a drinker. Yeah. And so 
I watched a film with a prologue where a psychiatrist is talking directly to the camera in a William Castle style. Really? 10 minute warning? Yeah, I saw it in the 90s and I'm like, so I'm watching this movie and it starts off with her in a boat and I'm like, this is not the Dementia 13 I remember. So I look it up and finally I saw that like, oh yeah, there's there's like a few cuts. 10 minute warning. There's a few cuts out there and I when I first saw this, I saw the cut with a different opening. And it was made specifically in a William Castle style by Roger Corman because he saw Francis Ford Coppola's movie yeah. as a bunch of shit. This is literally the second time I saw this. Now, it's the second time I've seen it, too. Now, the first time I saw it, I remember a particular actor being in it. That w- Now, it just could be a faulty memory that was not in it at this time and i can't think of what his name is but he was the guy who was in simon king of the witches if you ever saw that okay yeah and since since he was Roger simon Corbin i forget just... what his name it, yeah. what his name is he was very yeah. popular at the time and this looked like it could have been his first movie so where the fuck where the fuck did he go Let me tell you, this week's double feature of The Intruder and Dementia 13 was a difficult Roger Corman double feature for one very important reason. No dick. Yeah. Yeah. Dick Miller is in no way in any of these. You could shoo him in as a janitor. Yeah. Damn. Really? Yeah, there's no dick in The Intruder. There's no dick in Dementia 13, and the only dick in The Intruder is William Shatner. It's a dickless double, double feature. Dickless Roger Corman double yeah. feature. I'm not even going to have you explain the plot of Dementia 13 because oh, oh, it's please, fucking no. insane. No, 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 it's not. Here's the plot okay, of the movie. Okay, then go ahead, go ahead. If you can do it in like two minutes. Oh, less. There is an axe murderer. He kills a bunch of people. He gets caught. Then the rest is mindless filler that doesn't fucking go anywhere. Okay, okay, so there's a woman, and there's the woman's fat husband, and they're rowing in a boat, and the guy has a heart attack, but right before he dies, he's like, hey, I hate you, you're a bitch, and with me dead, you'll never get any money from my rich mother. So she's like, okay, then, when you're dead, I'm going to throw you overboard, pretend that you're off on business, Uh and have everyone come to this castle that we are at, so that I can win the family over and get all the money. And then she's killed by an axe murderer, and the film is just psycho in a castle. Well, well, right off the bat, she she gives the story about him going away, and nobody nobody questions it, nobody brings it up again. So that plot line is stopped there. She then gets up to other hijinks, and then she's killed by an axe murderer, so her whole plot line is now useless. Yeah. And didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And that is the same with, with everything else. And then the difficult part about Dementia 13 is, okay, this movie is shit. But is the movie shit because Francis Ford Coppola's first mainstream feature film was shit? Or is it shit because... Francis Ford Coppola made a genius film and Roger Corman says this sucks and I'm redoing all of it. Yeah. Or is it a uh, mishmash of both? Who knows? I, I would I would really I, I I whether it's right or wrong for this one I enjoy putting the entirety of the blame on Francis Ford Coppola. I'm fine with that too, and I'll Fuck tell you, you exactly Mr. why. Fuck you, Mr. Godfather. If I had to watch Dementia 13 four times or The Godfather Part 3 once, I would watch Dementia 13 four times. Okay. Just period, because fuck that last Godfather movie. That movie fucking sucked. Yeah. But yeah, this is a low budget Irish ripoff of Psycho in a castle. Uh-huh. It's got a it's boring. It makes no sense. The sound is shit. 
bad script, horrible dialogue, shitty film. I will say, though, you know the woman, the star who's then killed halfway into the film? Yeah. That was Vincent Price's sister from the last week's movie, The Pit and the Pendulum. Oh. Because Roger nice. Corman is going to Roger Corman, so of course he's using just the same fucking people over and over again. So that's the same chick. Yeah. Oh, and the the doctor person who ends up, you know, shooting the killer and saving the day? Yeah. He was in a bunch of other movies, including, and now the killing starts, Chariots of Fire and A Clockwork Orange. Oh, Clockwork. Yeah, so Clockwork Orange, he was, he was the rich liberal. Yeah. Who took Alex in? Yeah, dude had a career. Yeah. Good for you getting out of the Corman shadow. So, uh, so that that's that's all I've got this week. I, for this I week. also enjoyed the colorization. Yeah, because the colorization made the movie better by making it much worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so many different versions of this movie out there, but yeah, the coloring was horrible. But that's this week. Next week, we are continuing our summer yes. of bad Roger Corman films by looking at another double feature, and I'm super excited about this. I'm super excited about this. It, let me tell you, the other double features are all going to be gold. Next week, we're watching The Trip. Okay. Drop movie. And Piranha. Okay. Piranha. Very excited about that. So that's next week. We're also going to be playing a game. Two games, actually. I've actually written both of those out. I'm super excited. It's going to be so much fun. Such a fun episode. But that's next Piranha, week. Piranha now, was Jonathan Demi, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it was a Roger Corman film. Like, kind of a famous one of his. But uh, that's next week. Now that I'm looking back at this week, though, uh, Willie Shat, Julian Carlton. Yes. Frank Lloyd Wright's Haunted House. Project 2025, look up on look up that shit. Uh Donkey Kong owes its creation to Popeye. I gotta say, I think this has been a pretty darn good. A a pretty a pretty a, a, a good episode of the Pope on film. This has been a damn good episode. Yes. Yes, okay. I felt the same way, but I feel like like, you're the one who gives that distinction to the podcast and not me, and I don't want to step on any toes here. But, 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 yes, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend May Lynn, and on behalf of Natasha and Eleanor and Q and everybody else in the family, I just want to say thanks for listening, and we will see you next week, you godless heathens! And you do swaffles and poopy tuts. Thank you, Q. <laughs> Eleanor? <laughs> and you poo-poo. And you poo-poos? And you poo poos. Well, Max isn't here. And you waffles? You know, he'd say something weird like that. He always makes it up on the spot. And you fidget spinners. And you uh, digital circuses. Something like that. Do 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 do. And you Freddy Fazbear's. Do 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 do. <laughs> Do 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 skitty papa do wow cut and print. That's a wrap on episode 481. Woo!